This video is sponsored by DJ the Lazy Gamer, Zach Haji, and Crimson Manifesto. Fallout, the Demon's Apprentice goes rogue. After a few days of hit and miss bureaucracy, Mai Tarumi successfully grants Zabuza a full pardon for his past crimes. Then, last minute accommodations were made to complete the tuning exams with an impromptu round 3 essay section, since the hit and miss can't really devote any more time or resources to hosting a large competition. Now our favorite former Blade for Hire finds himself riding on a ferry back to the land of fire along with its team thoroughly embarrassed at having put in all that effort with Al, only to get caught in the end. And with nothing to show for it other than a scroll with a message to Tsunade from Mai, and the only consolation being that he at least did get to spend the time with his team. While Ebisu childishly pouts and glares at Zabuza a bit away, just as predicted, Konohamaru does indeed embellish and boast of his own achievements in the exams, but only after a very thorough teasing of Zabuza for getting himself caught that Moegi eventually couldn't help but join in on. And with all the bragging he's done to them about being an elite former mist assassin, the now leaf Jonin can only cross his arms in a rump as the duo crudely brainstorm a new epithet for him, more fitting than the master of silent killing. Eventually, he calms them by patting their heads and making it very clear that nonetheless, he is proud of them no matter of the results of the exam, because he can tell they're a tad upset with themselves over how they performed. Udon, however, had undergone the change that Zabaza had long awaited to see in the lab, as he was the only one of his kids to walk away with his tuning promotion. Apparently, only a handful of competitors did, but likely because most of their actual performance was based entirely on the second round hostage game. After letting himself be taken hostage, Udon successfully captured his would-be interrogators with the ninja art snot trap they developed within the opening minutes of the round starting, and then made it in time to aid Konohamaru and Moegi in subduing the older third member of a Guinean team for the mist they were pitted against. And according to those two, the guy was a formidable foe due to his kenjutsu and ninjutsu. He'd even snapped Konohamaru's sword again which Zawaza relished in using as an opportunity to warn the Saratobi they were going back to practice swords again since he couldn't handle his blade with any respect. However, pride still swells in Zawaza, as his students were able to pull together and win the game in a new record time for the Mist, even beating out the old morbid record of his getting graduation in the process. Smiling slightly, Udon sagely and confidently says that they're teasing him, though they know their master Zabuza was doing the right thing if he felt the need to break the rules. Chikamaru finally cuts in, asking Zabuza if he's really in the mood to joke around when he may be in massive trouble when they got back to the village. His probation was only near its end after all. Not to mention what they just witnessed Sasuke doing, shit was truly hating the fan for them. While this does bring everyone back to reality, it doesn't dull their moods as much as Shikamaru had thought it would, which was a pity considering he personally had an impending sense of doom ever since seeing Sasuke. He endures a few hours more of Team Zabuza's good time, and when their caravan reaches the Leaf Village, any mirth the children had to be with their sensei was drained away, as somewhat grimly both Shikamaru and Zabuza are escorted to Hokage Tower, as word of Zabuza and Sasuke's actions had already reached the Leaf and no doubt the other great nations hours before they arrived. Al was of course quickly rounded up and had his admittedly well maintained cover blown of no fault of his own, though after a quick parlay, he was simply sent back home. President of the officer, Team 7, as their closest to Zabuza saw them usually invested in these sorts of things. Not only that, but Old Man Jiraiya had also come home from checking on his spy network, meaning things were apparently dire. Tsunade silently glared at Zabuza for a long, tense while as all present, excluding Jiraiya, began to choke under the motherly Kage's quiet fury. Sweat dropping the tote, Sanin asked Zabuza to clarify his reasoning for his actions, finally prompting him to plead his case and hand over the message from the Mizukage herself. Curious though a bit embarrassed at Jiraiya's eyes, Scanning the words from over her shoulder, Tsunade surveys the scroll and for a moment, a flash of joy is seen along with rising stress in her eyes. Speaking frankly, she reveals that despite the least harboring a former Miss criminal and Sasuke's recent theft of a sacred treasure of the village, the Mizukage was only interested in coexistence with goodwill, and would in fact begin pushing for a peace treaty with the Leaf to enter into the same alliance as it in the sand. Jiraiya, however, specifies that this is the good news, and that they have way more bad news to give, as he reveals that Orochimaru had disappeared shortly before Sasuke's missed antics, leading the Sonning to believe that their old comrade's plans had backfired on him, meaning Sasuke somehow absorbed the old serpent and his power, a theory which only lends further credence to the testimony Zabuza and the Mizukage gave from their encounter with him. Naruto here does not feel any excitement, his second clash with Sasuke in this timeline leaving no more hope for turning him from the path of an Avenger. He only mourns the thought that his best friend has become a problem that affects not just the Leaf anymore, and of his own volition. His misdeeds can no longer be blamed on Orochimaru. This, however, does lead to another portion of good news Sakura reasons. If Sasuke is once again tracking his brother, then doing the same will inevitably lead to Sasuke, which admittedly is better than where they once stood scratching their heads at Orochimaru's erratic movements. However, this good news 
is indeed outnumbered as Tsunade then circles back to the matter of Zabuza's punishment. Konohamaru mouths off that the old lady heard Zabuza sensei's reasoning, so she should just let it slide like she always does. But instead of the usual slapstick routine the young Sarutobi expected of he and Tsunade naming worse and worse punishments at Zabuza's expense, he only received a disappointed and exhausted sigh from the woman he, like Naruto, had come to see his family, unnerving him that even the Hokage's hands are tied on this case. Zabuza already had a little favor with the most conservative faction of the Leafs Council represented by Donzo Shimura. If he isn't properly punished, Tsunade will find it a lot harder to deal with what she refers to as Sarutobi Sensei's original snake in the grass problem. So, they'd settled on two years of jail time with community service being fair, seeing as how Zabuza did go and get himself absolved of his past crimes, and helped clean up a Leaf Village bread mess from getting any worse. With good behavior, he could be out even sooner. The Swordsman's team began to instantly argue against this, but Zabuza barks at them to hush. He didn't act without preparing himself for the consequences. Taking a deep breath, he removes his bandolier holster for the Kubukiri Bocho, and then slowly, almost mournfully, tugs off the Leaf Village forehead protector which had begun to matter so much to him. As he hands both over, the doors to the office burst open to reveal bloodied and battered forms of the Chunin village gate guards Izumo and Kotetsu, calling desperately for their Kage and putting all present further on edge with the utterance of a single name, Akatsuki. Obviously needed at the hospital immediately, Tsunade, instead of questioning further, leaps into action, ordering the two Chunin to fill her in on the way, as it had already dawned on Shikamaru that last he heard from them, Team 10 was assigned to a joint mission with those guys on it in his absence and that same pin in his stomach from before starts to twist painfully as he suddenly bolts towards the hospital himself right on the heels of the Hokage and leaving Jiraiya, Team 7, and the Ginin of Zabuza squad alone to watch the swordsman be escorted away by Anvu, leaving the room silent and tense and causing all still present to realize Naruto is no longer among them. As they arrive, Tsunade and her three Chunin escorts are immediately directed where to go, with the youngest of their group worriedly running to his teammates as soon as he sees them. Ino is only lightly harmed, having been successful in stabilizing her own health and apparently doing her best for her team members judging by her fatigue. Choji, meanwhile, is suffering from multiple broken bones, but even so, the faithful tank of Team 10 remains on his feet. That is, until Tsunade catches on, snapping her fingers and instantly causing Sakura to body flicker to her side before a single order puts her into nurse mode and sees her force the portly boy into a treatment room of his own. Ino tries to prepare Shikamaru for what he's about to learn about Asuma's fate, but he stoically walks past her ahead of Tsunade to open the door for her with a morbid yet resolute expression. The room is silent other than the raspy breathing of Asuma, who occupies a wheelchair faced away from the door and positioned next to the room's only available bed, whose still occupant looks as if only just passed away. Tsunade steps into the room as Shikamaru pauses and stares at the departed and scarred Shinobi for a moment as he attempts to recall his name. It finally clicks after hearing Lady Tsunade sadly mutter the surname Namiyashi, as Asuma would always just call his former Ginning teammate Raido. Turning to address Asuma, the fist suddenly gasps and rushes over to him, activating the healing palm technique and causing Shikamaru's growing dread to increase as he too comes for a closer inspection. In horror at the sight, he comes to realize that his master has been relieved of both his left arm from the bicep lower and his right leg from the knee down. In his remaining hand is clutched a blood-soaked black cloak boned around a katana with a vanta black blade. As the world's greatest medic applies her skill to these wounds to hopefully heal the severed areas as much as possible, Asuma describes the conflict in an official report to his Kage, even as she currently foregoes that role for his well-being, causing Tsunade to damn him for trying to talk in his condition, and then herself for not taking greater care in Ino's medic nin training as she tries to better stabilize the main Joni. Still fresh in his mind and detailed, Asuma's story is both heartbreaking and yet an inspirational example of the village's will of fire being shared by so many. As the former member of the Guardian Shinobi 12 only begins to falter at the moment of recalling Raido's fall against the zombie Akatsuki, revealing his sacrifice in order to land a critical enough blow to stun their opponents long enough for Asuma and the rest to retreat with vital information. And allowing this timeline's Asuma to walk away from the encounter with both the secret to Hidan's curse technique and Kakuzu's true age and strange heart stealing technique. Before he can get much further, Asuma's voice breaks and he simply grows quiet. Shikamaru stares in bewilderment at his childhood hero, until Asuma in a broken voice sends a thanks to the spirits of both his father and Raido, crediting them for ensuring that he'd one day meet his child. Tears of guilt and anger begin to warm the Nara's eyes, as he regrets his involvement with the tuning exams even more, needing no confirmation that his teacher's days of protecting him are over. Tsunade decides she has already tolerated Shikamaru being here too long, even if he is a tuning and keeping his calm. Beyond being a shinobi, he is a young man who this will no doubt be traumatizing to. 
Taking the evidence from the battle out of Asuma's hands, she grimaces at just how much blood is soaked onto it all, before she asks Shikamaru to take this to the Intelligence Corps' forensic lab and have them analyze, separate, and collect the blood samples on them, since they will likely need them to plan their countermeasures based off of Asuma's testimony. With his head hung so low, a shadow is cast over his eyes as tears escape them. The Nara follows the command and walks away, as Tsunade minds him to watch the Kokuto's edge as it is coated in poison. As Shikamaru exits the hospital, he barely clocks in that Ino and Sakura have both congregated to helping heal Choji as apparently his injuries were far graver than they'd first appeared, and hearing Asuma's account of that fierce battle made it very clear why. He somberly walks on and suddenly feels a presence, and looks to his blind spot to see that Naruto is hot on his heels, and looking fairly concerned as he'd opened the door out of the hospital's entrance. Chika could only ask to chat later in a way that seemed less tired as much as hurt to Naruto, making him press on and eventually walking with his friend until he sighed and asked how much the Uzumaki overheard. Naruto reveals that it was the most important parts only, while offering his condolences and asking if Shikamaru knew about Asuma's quickly approaching fatherhood beforehand. Tiredly, he reveals that he didn't until today, and he then feels Naruto touch his shoulder supportively as the blonde poses a single question Shikamaru never thought he'd hear from his happy-go-lucky friend. Don't you want revenge? It gave Shikamaru pause, as he and the Uzumaki suddenly stop in the middle of the street and the village while the Nara processes. His immediate gut answer is obviously yes. Not only were his teammates hurt, but his teacher was nearly slain, and a comrade of theirs did go down just to get the rest of his team back with vital information and now he was being racked with the guilt of not being present to even help out when it happened, and the thought that Asuma would never have the simple pleasure of wrapping two arms around his kid. His mind had already been running through thousands of methods of defeating these so-called zombie Akatsuki in order to make so much sacrifice worth it in the end, but honestly, he hadn't truly considered any of them due to his awareness of his own grief clouding his judgment. Naruto once again uses his empathy to bridge the gap of silence and reassures Shikamaru that everyone involved feels the same way, but he admits that his drive for payback is much more selfish. While he's angry at person who had been a distant mentor, comrade, and a friend to Zabaza has had his life forever changed and a leaf countryman lost his own life in the battle, his true drive is threefold. First and foremost being his growing need to hit something hard after a full day of such shitty news. Secondly, it's his desire to test the fruits of his intense training, but the most pressing reason the Uzumaki reveals to his friend is because he is the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, and the Akatsuki were no doubt in the land of fire for him in the first place, so Naruto had ample reasoning for wanting to bring the fight to them this time. To Naruto's shock, Shikamaru shows no surprise at the last reason, only citing that he at least appreciates his friend being honest about something he suspected for a while. However, none of that changes the fact that pursuing the Akatsuki with clouded judgment won't help anyone hence his turning Naruto's vague offer for revenge down. Before he can enter the Intelligence Corps' headquarters, Naruto appeals to him a final time, inciting two facts. Number one, that if the battle were to go poorly, he is 100% willing to do as Raido did and sacrifice himself so his comrades may live, reminding Shikamaru of his own voluntary decoy status back during the Leaf Crush plan and how Naruto wouldn't let him go at it alone. And number two was something he'd learned from helping Zawaza with Konohamaru and his other students. They weren't going to be kids forever. At some point, it will be time to stand up and be an example to the next generation. So what kind of example was Shikamaru going to be? The Nara stares down at the bloody tools of Raido Namiyashi in his hand silently, before walking forward to fulfill his orders from the Hokage. Later in the evening, Tsunade finally leaves the hospital after an emotional last few hours of dealing with injuries and seeing Kurunai and Asuma so genuinely grateful for their situation, as they were both starkly aware of how tragic it could have been. As she returns to her office, she is surprised to see Jiraiya still there, filling in for her as best he can. Thanking him, she asks if he's heard anything from the forensics lab, and the Toad Sani confirms that they received the items that needed and are hard at work of their orders before he changes the subject to ask how the students in Team 10 are holding up. She reports that Eno seems to be nearly depressed, and she expects it's due to a feeling of inadequacy. Choji had been fairly silent after replenishing its strength with tasteless hospital food, opting to sleep rather than be entertained by his friends. And as for Shikamaru, she knew he was taking this harder than anyone, but hadn't seen him since forcing him to go away. Jiraiya nods gravely, and reminds that Naruto seemed to be in similar straits between one of his mentors being forcefully retired and one incarcerated. Not to mention, he was certain the news of Sasuke's latest outing would drive the blonde to some rash action sooner or later, cautioning that they should keep a close eye on him and all the other young and impetuous shinobi, as he advises that he'd even set Kakashi on gate duty to deter any foolish attempts at an earlier revenge strike on the Akatsuki. 
This seems to ease Tsunade for a moment until said Jonin suddenly body flickers into the room with a guilty look on his face, as he asks the signing to take a look at the night sky which just barely hosts the silhouette of a massive bird with three riders atop it before it disappears into the distance. The fifth then crushes her teacup in shock, anger, and worry at the obvious act of insubordination needing no further clarification on at least two of the culprits and having a strong hunch on the third's identity, as she then orders Jiraiya and Kakashi to take Yamato with them and bring the three young rogues back alive. A few minutes earlier, behind Shikamaru's house at the Nara clan compound, Shikaku and his son have just finished a calming game of Shogi that the youngster once again dominated, and we're both now sitting and looking up at the moon while a couple of deer graze in front of them. There is nothing left to say, as the father has already given his counsel and trusts that no matter what, Shikamaru will make the correct decision, and even if he doesn't, his boy has become a man who can reliably pull through tough obstacles. With a pat to his son's head, he reminds him not to taint Asuma's sacrifice by losing anything or anyone else, and to take the lessons of the experience in parts to heart as he retires for the night. Nodding, Shikamaru is resolute when he turns his head to see he now has two new companions, in the form of Naruto and Sai, who is carrying a bundle of cold weather cloaks, as well as Raido's ebony blade and black cloak now clean of the blood that once sullied them. Naruto tosses them three vials of blood, causing the shadow user to catch them and apologize to the blonde as he doubted his claim of being able to break into any place and steal anything undetected a la his snagging of the scroll of seals in chapter 1. Looking to Sai, Shikamaru can't help but question why he wants to tag along so bad, but the artist member of the route actually jokes that he can leave if Shikamaru would rather walk, as he kneels down to focus on a drawing and creates his ninja art of cartoon beast mimicry, Giant Hawk, providing a more than worthy steed for them. With a shared nod, all three shinobi don their cloaks and set off from the leaf with a thirst for victory or vengeance. As they depart, multiple people around the village of the Kakashi and the Sanin watch them, including Ino, Choji, Sakura, as well as Asuma and Kuranai. And in his cell, Zabuza looks up at the ceiling and gets a strange feeling that he won't be needed to avenge his drinking buddy, and so decides he can roll over and get some sleep. However, not long into his rest is he awakened harshly by a rather graphic dream involving the Mizukage, sparking a myriad of questions as to why his mind would even conjure such things about a woman he viewed as insane and terrifying. Meanwhile, on route to their targets, Naruto and Sai are both able to show off a great deal of tracking skill gained under teaching from Zabaza and Jiraiya or Danzo and Root respectively, allowing Shikamaru time to focus on concocting a surefire strategy to take their opponents down while simultaneously dealing a massive blow to the Akatsuki as a whole. Sliding the Kokuto partly out of a sheath Naruto had gotten from Ten Ten Ford and staring at it as well as a pair of Asuma's trench knives, he begins to think of something that just may work beautifully. It is the early morning as the Cloak Takatsuki duo continue to scope through the land of fire with the sunrise in front of them, doing a poor job of keeping a low profile as they bicker back and forth loudly about their encounter with the band of Leaf Shinobi only a day or so earlier. The older of the duo, Kakuzu, is enraged that he wasted his time by not being able to collect on the sizable bounty of Sarutobi Asuma, or even the much less significant one of his comrade Raido Namayashi. He begins to grit his teeth and growl in irritation as the more rambunctious and surly Hidon harks on about the will of Joshin being carried out regardless, and further annoying his partner by declaring Kakuzu an ignorant heretic for valuing money over the sweet carnage they wrought. The rogue waterfall then prepares a threatening retort, but something catches his eye as he finally sees a massive bird shadow pass overhead, as three smaller shadows break off from it. Cursing, he shoves his slower partner out of the way and forces Hidon and himself to be divided as three shinobi have ambushed them from the air one in particular more valuable and immediately recognizable to the duo than any bounty as they confirm the blonde seemingly leading this little attack is the Leafs Nine Tails Jinchuriki. As Naruto unsheaves the Yukioni and Sai his short root tanto, Shikamaru similarly readies the technically stolen Kokuto with a slight unfamiliarity and speaks for the group, provoking that they aren't just here to avenge comrades, but to take a step in putting a stop to the Akatsuki once and for all. Hidon scoffs at this, guessing that Raido was his master or something, but in the moment he does, Shikamaru runs in headlong, which makes Hidon grin and leap in as well to take a swipe at his sight. Red metal clashes with black, but due to Shikamaru's slightly lesser strength and an intelligent last second jump backwards to rob Hidon's blow of some of his force, the leaf chewing is sent sailing backwards and away from everyone else. This invigorates Hidon, and he redoubles his efforts to draw blood, splitting up from Kakuzu of his own volition. Kakuzu's eyes don't leave Naruto's, even as he orders Sai to go with Shikamaru and make sure his strategy works while he handles this guy. Sai agrees and departs, allowing Naruto to ask Kakuzu about his past to confirm the rumor of his having survived and encountered the first Hokage. Confidently, the century-old Shinobi confirms this, only to ask what it has to do with Naruto before he is off-put by the excitement on his face and the sensation of killing intent leaking off him. 
As the Jinchuriki swordsman narrows now a blue slitted eyes at the zombie ninja and it clears the first will be another idol of his that he's going to surpass right here and right now by ripping Kakuzu to shreds. As Shikamaru continues the defense against a superior physical opponent with a weapon he's never used out of necessity for his strategy, he quickly realizes his speed seems to be all he has as a major advantage against the follower of Jashin. And this combined with his having to maneuver his new sword in a specific way meant it was quickly becoming chipped, a dishonor to the man who once wielded it and a detriment to his plan. However, a glimpse of Sai speeding towards them and giving silent hand motions encourages him to enact his idea now as he suddenly counters a swipe for his liver by bracing the Kokuto with both hands and pushing forward so hard and fast, sparks fly as he slides in closer to Hidon in order to shoulder check him and perform a hand sign to activate his shadow stitching jutsu, causing black spires to erupt from their shadows and skewer Hidon for some light piercing damage. Shikamaru then explains that that first one was for Raido, but Sai yells for him to watch out as Hidon's still able to move despite pain which will incapacitate than a normal person due to his sheer durability and pain tolerance and so he quickly leaps forward for another uninspired swipe with his scythe. Shikamaru moves just in time to not be guillotined thanks to Sai flipping over Hidon and grabbing the Nara by his collar to pull him away from the scythe blades before they bite flesh. Having missed, Hidon sings songs that they're quick but not enough as he then reveals a bit of blood on his scythe and Shika looks down in horror to see a slash on the back of his leg as Hidon laps his blood up to activate his curse. However, Sai reminds him that he didn't risk such a straightforward approach from behind just to save his comrade and forms a ram seal. Hidon then hesitates as he feels something scamper up his back only to look at his shoulder and see an ink rat that's holding an explosive tag in his mouth. It glows as it detonates violently and obscures Hidon in a cloud of dust. Meanwhile, Kakuzu suddenly summons up courage to ignore Naruto's threats and moves to try and speed blitz him. But just as he does, Naruto pulls off a familiar hand sign and suddenly a thick mist surrounds the small barren area they are in as he copies the hidden mist jutsu, with full awareness to keep it out of Shikamaru's way lest he impede his friend's shadows. Swinging at only open air, Kakuzu curses the boy only to suddenly find himself ran through the snow demon Zion from behind as the mist clears a bit, showing that Uzumaki can also imitate the silent killing technique. However, Kakuzu chides that he should have gone for one of his hearts instead, as his cloak tears away to reveal that Naruto has missed all four masks embedded in his back. Then just as suddenly they open their mouths and destroy him with a combined burst of fire, wind, lightning and earth chakra, which appears to completely consume the Jinchuriki. The dust around Hidon clears at the same time to reveal he is no worse for wear. Having already drawn the cursed circle on the ground as he produces a pike to pierce himself with while Shikamaru and Sai's eyes widen in fear. The former suddenly tries to run in order to put distance between himself and the surefire kill technique. Before he gets far though, Hidon drives the pike deep into his own foot and Shikamaru goes stumbling, allowing the Kokuto to go sliding away from him as he clutches his own new injury. Laughing maniacally, Hidon then pierces his own leg over and over until Shikamaru finally cries out in pain. Sai tries to interfere but Hidon throws the scythe out so it first impedes his motion and then uses its cord to manipulate the weapon on a string almost as well as Sasori could as he moves with such skill as to fight the socially challenged boy off with ample distance. Cackling at the irony of sending a student to meet his teacher and how Joshin would be pleased, Hidon then pierces his own heart in order to kill Shikamaru and the boy falls still and silent. He then shifts focus to Sai who has to devote everything to defense rather than mourning his own comrade, but like Shikamaru, he can't match the power of the Akatsuki and a gash is soon opened along his side after a failed parry. The scythe is then reeled in so Hidon can claim his next victim. Kakuzu scoffs at this and continues to have his mask look around for Naruto as he doubts such a blast will be lethal. However, his answer for Naruto's presence is a rather embarrassing one as he recognizes far too slowly that he should have removed the massive sword in his chest long ago. Just as Naruto transforms from that sword back into himself and uses their close proximity to capture the old shinobi in an inverted headlock and then fall back to plant his skull ruthlessly into the ground before rolling away and back to his feet to prepare for the next clash. Bragging that like Shikamaru had said earlier in this battle, every blow was for a comrade. Grunting in irritation at such paltry tricks, Kakuza returns to his feet and questions why Naruto would emulate a dead man. But suddenly, a striking pain in one of his hearts signals him as to why as he falls right back down flat on his face. Naruto then spits on the ground near him in contempt that he promised the first heart to Shikamaru. Meanwhile, Hidon finally stops cackling over the seemingly dead bodies of Sai and Shikamaru. He turns his back to leave only to have to react to killing intent behind him by raising his scythe in order to block the incoming attack, as Shikamaru is suddenly back on his feet and trying to take his head off with the ebony blade. Shocked, Hidon questions how, only to be answered with Shikamaru roaring in fury as he pours his chakra into the sword to enhance his cutting power, remembering that the first sample of blood they used to trick Hidon had been taken from its former master Raido after all. 
Emboldened, Shikamaru uses his shadow stitching again, but this time to fling one of Asuma's trench knives at his opponent from behind, which Hidan barely uses his pike to block. However, that split second opening allows Sai to reveal he too is alive and well and to attack Hidan's flank and put all his power into a blow that snaps the pike in half, before incapacitating the arm that used it and robbing Hidan's defense of half of its power, allowing Shikamaru to put his back into his attack and causing Hidan's scythe and the Kokudo to both snap in half. Hidan curses them for destroying a tool of Joshin, only for Shikamaru to slightly kick the broken blade through the Akatsuki member's chest and quickly binding him with a shadow paralysis, as Sai prepares to slice him further. But Hidan is strong enough to force his way out of it and even dislocates his arm to extend it and grabs Sai from beyond its length, nearly pulling Shikamaru's out of socket along with it if not for his releasing his hold. Simultaneously, Kakuzu's remaining hearts converge on Naruto for a pincer attack that causes him to jump to avoid it. Kakuzu then growls while piecing himself back together for another countless time during the battle and has his lightning style heart go to grab Naruto in the air while his wind and fire hearts converge to blow a massive combo attack at him while immobilized. However, instead of panicking where he once lacked sufficient power to fight from this distance, Naruto instead bows that this attack should be familiar then, as heavy blue chakra begins to roll off his sword. And as the lightning heart goes to grab him, Naruto makes a clone to swing himself up and onto its back while his free hand takes the hilt of his blade to prepare for what was quickly becoming one of his new favorite moves. Blue light explodes over the area from above, causing the shadows to be enlarged all around at the exact moment Hidon fights off Sai. Suddenly feeling empowered, Shikamaru switches from the destroyed ebony blade to his master's remaining trench knife and surges forward to help Sai, only mildly recognizing that his opponent seems to be moving a lot slower all of a sudden. As if by instinct, instead of the usual chakra enhancement the specially made blades draw out of their user, Shikamaru's dark shadowy chakra is applied to them, and seems to leak from their metal and his arm, which moves at a speed even the Nara himself cannot perceive, until he finally realizes that he has already zoomed completely past Hidon. The Akatsuki member seems confused for a moment before looking down to Sai and grinning as if he intends to continue using his strength to dominate, but instead, he suddenly blinks and finds himself looking up at a shocked Sai in the back of Shikamaru's still cloaked figure. Struggling to move, he comes to realize his head has been separated from his body, which itself has been diced up beyond repair, even with Kakuzu's aid. Sai then blinks in surprise at such a new and seemingly powerful technique from Shikamaru, questioning if that was a part of the plan, while the Nara huffs and puffs in exhaustion and replies that it was something like that. Meanwhile, back on the ground, Naruto approaches Kakuzu in the massive crater his helmet crush had created, after riding the lightning heart as it crashed. Smirking, he finds his opponent nearly smeared into the ground along with his strange hearts and those freaky threads. Pleased with his progress over training, he snarks that he bets even the first Hokage couldn't use the move that well, but suddenly Kakuzu's hand shoots out to capture him by the throat, as the lightning heart jolts back to life and electrocutes him into unconsciousness. Kakuzu is then the one to gloat that the boy is centuries too early to compare himself to a god among shinobi like Hashirama Senju, but he's interrupted as Hidan's voice calls out to him that he's been tricked like an old fool. Looking around in shock, he sees not only has his comrade been defeated, beheaded, and captured, but he was also unsuccessful in defeating either of the small fries in Naruto. Growling, he moves to aid his partner, but as he does, the Naruto in his grasp is revealed to be a clone, and using the silent killing technique, Naruto once again appears in his blind spot, but this time with the Rasen Shuriken ready to finish the Akatsuki member off with. Though here, because of the vast power difference, there is actually nothing left of him to bring back the leaf, as the attack is pure overkill, unfortunately resulting in worse damage to Naruto's arm from the recoil, but thankfully, Hidan's capture is an even better reward. A few hours later in the leaf, Tsunade is informed that Naruto, Shikamaru, and Sai have returned as she orders them to be escorted to her immediately in an even tone. Upon their arrival in a rather long and harsh scolding as well as some treatment, the boys are asked what they have to say for themselves. Shikamaru then presents Hidan's still living and currently gagged head as he and Naruto had earlier bickered back and forth incessantly. Regardless, the boys present a captured Akatsuki member alive, so hopefully the village can gain some valuable intel from it. Naruto then grins that surely his granny can't stay mad at them now since they brought back something so useful, but sternly Tsunade says that she can and is, and for running off like that the trio can expect to jot in jail themselves. Sai nods stoically while Shikamaru calls this news a drag, but Naruto keeps his eyes on the Hokage, saying that it isn't fair to throw his two friends in jail since they were only following his lead. So if anyone should get the prison sentence, it's him. Shikamaru asks Naruto if he knows what he's doing, but echoing Zabaza, Naruto grins that he wouldn't have gone through with this if he wasn't prepared to face the consequences. This is not lost on Tsunade, who lets out a long-suffering sigh and says that if that's the case, Naruto will serve three months in prison. 
one for himself and another for each of the idiot boys he roped in with him, while Shikamaru and Sai will each get 30 hours of community service. She then grins wryly, saying that Shikamaru will do his service at the hospital, scrubbing bedpans and taking less mobile patients to their appointments, while Sai's talents will be put to best use by giving the village gate a new coat of paint. As for Naruto, she's already got a cellmate lined up for him, another reckless shinobi who thinks he can run away from the village whenever he wants. Tsunade then finishes this decree with the smallest of winks to the boys, and when they realize what she's done, Shikamaru and Naruto return the gesture before being led away to their assigned punishments. Meanwhile, somewhere near the Land of Lightning, another battle is about to begin. But this Plus Ultra Fam is where we'll be leaving this story off for right now. Hey y'all, I hope you enjoyed this one. I tried to go with the same minimalist visual style from the last part of the Jiraiya Dr. Naruto series to make this one a little easier to get out, and I had a lot of fun writing this arc of the story with the fruits of Zabuza's influence kind of pushing a few things ahead a little bit so we can kind of streamline it all. Really glad my first Naruto What If story is now in what I think we can definitively call the final stretch of its main storyline, so please be sure you're subbed and have notifications on so you don't miss new episodes of this series and others. Big shout out to Cobb's Art for the new commissioned artworks used throughout this video, as well as Maxi Uchiha22 and everyone else who provided renders. They're all listed in the doobly doo along with my socials, which you should follow for constant sneak peeks and updates. Finally, a big thank you to all of our YouTube channel members, but an especially big thanks to our patrons Samuel Viveros, thank you, Infernate Beast 326 thank you, Shannon Roberts, thank you, Jay Ure, thank you, Narku, thank you, Normandy1998, thank you, Knuckles OX, thank you. Pizza15x, thank you. Don, thank you. Crimson Manifesto, thank you. Zach Haji, thank you. And DJ the Lazy Gamer, thank you. Your support means the world, as does everyone else's, so as always, be sure to take care of yourselves and the world around you. Happy Pride Month, trans rights, and as always, go beyond plus ultra.